Our word of communion is back in the book of Philippians this week. We are in the book of Philippians chapter 2. And our word of communion is entitled Seagulls and Doves. Last week for edification, we took a moment to reflect on the idea of rejoicing in the Lord. We were reminded that whenever God gives us instructions, it's because for whatever reason, we need to be reminded that how we think, speak, and act can bring us and others closer to Jesus or push us and others away from him. And we remember that true joy is found in Christ alone. But today, let's try to make that idea more practical. What kind of mindset do I need to receive that joy? Where does my heart need to be focused? And I think God speaks to these issues many places, but including here in Philippians chapter 2. So let's read a few verses. And as we do, I want to draw your attention to one word, and that's the word let. Okay, focus on the word let and then what it's saying. So Philippians 2, 1 through 8. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So did you notice the word let? A couple observations, and this is really interesting. In the Greek, the only let is in verse 5. What's going on in verses 3 and 4 is the lets are implied by the verb, look out. So if you look in verse 4 there, it says, look out not only for his own interests. All the lets in three or four are implied by that word. And the idea of look out is to take heed, to observe, to contemplate. It's not a simple passing glance. It's a very intentional, steady gaze. So let me rephrase verses three and four with that idea of take heed. Take heed to do nothing through selfish ambition or conceit. But in loneliness of mind, take heed to esteem others better than yourself. Take heed to look out, not only for your own interests, but for the interests of others. Do you see the pattern? It's intentional. It's not my ambitions or my interests. It's intentionally putting others first in my life, putting others' needs above my greeds. You see, in America, and especially here in California, I've noticed that, unfortunately, we have a seagull problem. You guys remember the seagulls in Finding Nemo? Mine, 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 mine. mine. <laughs> we see it in the headlines every day. Corrupt politicians weaponize a public health crisis, lining their own pockets, securing their own power through unemployment fraud and behested payments, exchange for political appointments as they divide and confuse the public over who gets to wear a mask. Remember James 2.9. If you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So church... When God called us out from the world, he put to death that old seagull mentality of the flesh, and he raised us back to life as innocent doves in Christ. Amen. We owe no allegiance to the patterns and the systems of this world except what Christ calls us to. 
respect positions of authority he puts in place, Christ-like love toward one another, and pure-hearted obedience to the good works Christ calls us to do before an unbelieving world, that they may see and glorify our God in heaven. Truth be told, though, I find myself sitting on the fence quite a lot. I've got one leg dangling over that green pasture of my good shepherd, while my other leg is dangling over all the juicy, spicy drama of the world. Because, boy, it can be pretty interesting and enticing, right? But think about this. Fences are hard bricks, planks of wood, cast iron rods. They don't have seat cushions. There ain't no joy sitting on a fence. That's my point. So if we want to receive that true everlasting joy that Christ promises to give us, we have to get down off the fence and jump wholeheartedly into the pasture following the example of Jesus, humbly surrendering to the will of the Good Shepherd. And that means following the heart of Jesus by intentionally and lovingly looking to the needs of others the same way he looked at us in our need because we were dead in our sins. But Jesus stepped down from glory, emptied himself, died for our sins on the cross, and rose again that we could find new life in him. And that is why we remember communion. That is why we celebrate it. And the beauty of doing it together is reminding each other about that the wafer or the bread, whatever you might have at home, something to munch on, it represents the body of Christ that was broken in our place. So let's take and eat. And the juice, it represents the blood of Christ that was shed for the remission of sins and also represents the new covenant, the Holy Spirit now indwelling us. Let's take and drink. Father God, we praise you. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the body. Thank you for taking us out of the mire, calling us down off that fence into your good pasture leading us to living water and renewing our souls. Lord, help us to lay our cares down. Help us to repent again of our sins and to follow you this week. In Jesus' name, amen.